Last June, we reported on the mystery of the deformed frogs. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I say, good grief, what is this? We told you the defects might be traced to parasites or ultraviolet light or chemical compounds. I look at the frogs and they look like they've been treated with retinoids. Investigators fanned out over the summer in search of the cause, worried about its implications for humans. I'd have to say driven is the word for those of us who are working on this. Then today, an important announcement from Minnesota. We're, we're here because we found that there's something in the water. Tonight, the frogs, one step closer to solving the mystery. It's not, as Kermit the Frog once famously noted, it's not that easy being green. Indeed, over the last couple of years, being a frog in certain parts of the country seems to have carried some ominous consequences with it. We wouldn't normally consider the plight of frogs to be worth even one program were it not for the fact that frogs are to the environment what canaries once used to be to coal mines. The miners would take them down into the pits because canaries are particularly sensitive to coal gas. And when one of them keeled over, the miners knew it was time to evacuate. So it was that back in June, we reported on growing concern in Minnesota, Vermont, and Quebec over the discovery of quite a few deformed frogs. There was any number of theories on what caused the deformities, but no conclusions. Over the summer, significant abnormalities in frogs were also found in Wisconsin, Missouri, New York, Connecticut, Oregon, Washington, and California. Nightline producer Dan Morris and correspondent Chris Bury thought there was enough there to warrant another program. Most of the scientific attention is still focused on Minnesota, where deformed frogs have now been discovered at 85 sites in 21 counties. Here's Chris Bury. On a chilly morning in April, Robert McKinnell, a prominent biologist, set out to crack the strange case of the Minnesota frogs. Well, this beautiful adult frog and all of its compatriots mm -hmm. Well, these frogs give rise to abnormal offspring. We don't know that for sure, but because there were so many last year, we think it's a, a real possibility. Huh. It feels like a bony structure there that shouldn't be. Chip, these are... Jack, can we take a photograph of that? Sure, it had been nearly her. two years since a class of middle school students on a nature outing had stumbled upon one freakish frog after another at this farm pond in Henderson, Minnesota. There was some where the legs were just grossly twisted and misshapen. And a couple without legs. A couple, oh, a lot of them with only one leg. Later on, we caught some with only one eye and some with five front legs. That was one of the grossest ones I've ever seen, the five extra front legs. The discovery might have been dismissed as a local oddity, but soon scientists documented similar deformities all over Minnesota, parts of Canada, and Vermont. Two extra front legs on the left side of that one. Both quite worthless, one sticking up and one is upside down. Biologists such as David Hoppe at the University of Minnesota in Morris cataloged a grotesque gallery of extra limbs, missing legs, and other severe organ defects. You notice how the right eye has that completely dark pigmentation and the left eye is transparent, the outer part, portion of the eye. Biologists grew alarmed because frogs are like environmental sponges. Their skin soaks up whatever is in the water or in the air. They are considered a sentinel species, one that signals trouble ahead, even to humans. And Professor McKinnell, for one, saw the strange deformities as an omen. Something was terribly wrong. We've got a problem. I think the problem is real. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I say, good grief, what is this? The first suspects included parasites that at least one scientist believed attacked budding limbs, splitting and stunting the legs. 5.48. Other scientists looked at ultraviolet radiation already known to damage frog eggs. 
Still others concentrated on chemicals in the environment, pesticides and herbicides, including methoprene, widely used to control mosquitoes and suspected of scrambling early development during the metamorphosis from tadpole to frog. Here in Minnesota and in other hot zones where deformities have been documented, scientists spent the summer chasing down leads. Two big questions had to be answered. First, would they find more deformities in the field, evidence of a serious recurring problem? And second, would detective work back in the lab lead them any closer to a leading suspect? Early in July, investigators for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency answered the first question. Judy, it looks like he's missing his left front eye. You're kidding. Yeah, 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 there's no eye. Here, severe eye deformities were found just as tadpoles completed their metamorphosis. You can see he's a tree frog with the little sucker toes that he has already. And he appears to have normal toes and feet and legs, but he's missing the left eye. We can't see any eye there at all. By late July, it became clear to scientists that huge numbers of deformities were not isolated cases, but part of a far-reaching and disturbing pattern. Here in Vermont, where a few deformed frogs were found last fall, investigators fanned out into the field throughout the summer. This time, they found deformities from one end of the state to the other. That was good. At one site along the Poultney River in northern Vermont, researchers scooped up more than 100 frogs only a few days after they had shed their tadpole tails. What we'll do is look at his eyes and make sure that they're symmetrical and that they're in the right place, which these are. Check that he has four toes in the front, which all amphibians do. Whoa! <laughs> And then we pull out both of their legs to see if they're symmetrical. And as you can see, they're not. This guy is missing the uh, left hind leg. Nearly every other frog had a significant deformity, most often a missing leg. Here's another one, left leg missing entirely. We found 121 frogs, and 45% of them did have some type of deformity. All the deformities involved uh, one or both of the rear legs. There, there weren't any abnormalities seen in the front limbs. We didn't see any missing eyes or eye problems. Could predators possibly be responsible for all those missing legs? Turtles or snakes or even frog-on-frog -frog crime? These frogs are so small, most of them are under you know, an inch, inch and a half long, that if something grabs a hold of them, it's going to get them. Whether it's a snake or a raccoon or a bird, they're not going to just get a toe. They're going to get the whole frog. From Vermont, the deformed frogs were shipped to the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin, a kind of medical examiner for animals. There is a malformation of the right limb. There's no evidence of scarring or injury associated with this malformation. Here, extensive tissue analysis turned up no evidence of bacteria, viruses, or unusual parasites. These grasshoppers will trick you. In Minnesota, meanwhile, investigators returned to the field early in August. Once again, they found deformities in more than 10% of their sample. Here, too, the most common affliction was a missing leg. It never developed. Mm -hmm. It's completely yeah. gone. Yeah, never popped up. This summer, other research sites yielded far different results. These specimens, with as many as 10 legs, this one has eight, were found in the same spot that has produced frogs with extra limbs before. 70 degrees is the water temp. As the summer drew to a close, some of the students who, back in 1995, had first focused attention on the Minnesota frogs, returned to the farm pond near Henderson. For the third straight year, they found significant deformities. The sentinel species was still trying to tell us something. And as investigators in the field continued collecting samples, their colleagues in the lab were doing the hard detective work. Part two of Chris Bury's report when we come back.
All summer long, back in their labs, investigators narrowed their search for a suspect and chopped away at each other's theories. Stan Sessions, a biology professor at Hartwick College, kept pushing his hypothesis that deformities like these occur naturally. Our data indicates that natural phenomena are sufficient to explain all of the deformities that are being reported. But that does not mean that there isn't a chemical involved, too. All I'm saying is that the natural phenomena are sufficient. In one experiment, Sessions claims parasites invaded a budding limb, producing this extra bone growing from a young frog's leg. His theory is such parasites explain the extra limbs. As for those missing legs... Here's a tadpole that has a limb that's been chewed down to the, down to the bone. Sessions blames tadpole cannibalism. This one has an abnormal eye. And what causes that? His face was attacked by another tadpole. We brought in over a thousand bullfrog tadpoles into the lab and raised them in the lab away from all other predators. Uh, and imagine our amazement to find all of the deformities showing up right in our lab animals. And the only thing that could cause that is, is tadpoles chewing on each other. I believe with all my heart this is not predation. And furthermore, I don't think it's, it's parasites. I can't prove that it's not parasites at the present time, but I think it's very unlikely that a parasite would cause all these abnormalities. Why? Because of the discovery Professor McKinnell made in July in his lab at the University of Minnesota. His kidneys look good. In a study of frogs with external abnormalities, such as missing or extra limbs, McKinnell found most animals also had extensive damage to their internal organs. Gut, bladder, male reproductive organ, those are the ones which we know are very clearly abnormal. I have never in my career ever seen an abnormality such as that. For McKinnell, who studied frogs for nearly 40 years, his discovery all but rules out parasites and predators. Why would that affect the development of the gonads, that is the reproductive organs? Why would that affect the, uh, the uh, digestive system such that the animal couldn't digest anymore? I think that's very, very unlikely. Throughout the spring and summer here in San Diego, scientists at two prominent research institutions focused on the pesticide methoprene, one of the early suspects in this mystery. They were trying to answer a fundamental and critical question. Can the bizarre deformities found in the field be reproduced in the laboratory? At the Scripps Institute, James LeClaire, a molecular biologist, and his colleagues made that scientific leap for the very first time producing deformities in frogs using natural byproducts of methoprene. Low levels of metabolites, products which come from methoprene, cause deform deformities in frogs. This material can cause it. We've shown this in the lab. It can cause deformities similar to those being found. At four days, we create these abnormal animals. They have problems with the gut area. They have problems with eyes being close together, a sort of what we call a cyclops or cyclopia. And even parts of the eye are not normal, like you get two lenses on one eye. So that's very abnormal. And interestingly, no mouths on many of the embryos. Other research at the Salk Institute in San Diego suggests methoprene may produce those defects by activating growth hormones, the genetic signals that tell frogs or any animal how to develop. Methoprene is a compound we should be concerned about. I don't mean to say that methoprene is terrible stuff and should be banned, but I think that we should look very carefully at methoprene, at, at its effects, and at how much methoprene we dump into the environment, where we put it, and where it ends up. Many cities and towns use methoprene to control mosquitoes. It's also used to fight biting flies. The chemical is fed to cattle, which then excrete it. And methoprene is a common ingredient in flea control products for pets. You shouldn't wait until you see fleas, but start him on program now. In a statement today, Wellmark International, the manufacturer of methoprene, said, quote, there is no geographic connection between methoprene and frog deformities. It also criticized research conducted in artificial laboratory settings using grossly exaggerated dose rates. The levels we use are much higher than the recommended treatment doses when they spray for mosquitoes. But the levels we use are actually much lower than the levels you encounter when you set off a flea bomb in your house or when you take your dog or cat to be flea dipped. 
But the EPA, for one, is not convinced the chemical is the culprit. And many scientists believe a combination of factors is at work. The EPA's own lab studies this summer suggest direct exposure to ultraviolet light is even more potent than methoprene in reproducing certain birth defects, including missing limbs. And this is an even more severe case where the femurs appear to have developed relatively normally, and there's only a small segment of what would be the lower leg uh, developed in this frog here. The uh, fact that uh, we saw hind limb deformities associated with the ultraviolet light uh, exposure is a pretty remarkable observation. It hasn't been seen before. So a long summer of detective work in the lab produced plenty of good leads, but not enough hard evidence to point to one suspect over another. That is until today, when officials in Minnesota made a dramatic announcement. That in part three of Chris Bury's report. Some scientists have suspected all along that the ponds and wetlands where frogs breed and lay eggs would hold the key to the mystery. In Minnesota, water samples were collected throughout the summer at hot spots with the highest concentration of deformed frogs. Now for the first time, we have some evidence that there's something in the water. Today, in St. Paul, state and federal public health officials announced startling preliminary results from a major lab study. Plain water collected from two hot spots, including home tap water pumped from nearby wells, caused deformities of the brains, eyes, and guts in frog embryos. In summary, we found that the uh, uh, water from sites where malformed frogs had been reported uh, were very potent in uh, malforming frogs uh, in this laboratory experiment. We've got uh, no reason to believe or not to believe that anything that you're hearing about today uh, would be transferable into any human impacts. Uh, but we did use um, the water from these people's drinking water supplies and did a test and it had some impact on the frogs. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is already concerned enough to take some immediate action. Biologist Judy Helgen. The state of Minnesota is providing bottled water for these residents just as a precaution. Uh, we have no knowledge or reason to say that there is a potential human health problem, but it's a very active uh, area of our investigation. You're taking it seriously? Taking it very seriously. The experiment, conducted by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, found a striking correlation. Water from one suspected hotspot induced deformities in 75 to 100 percent of the frogs. Water from control samples produced no deformities. Since this water is shown to induce deformities, doesn't that suggest that we're talking about pollution in the water? It certainly would appear to be pollution in the water, or at least it would be an agent that's in the water. The exact identity of that agent or agents still remains a big mystery, and scientists have not completely ruled out a natural suspect. But today's announcement dramatically narrows their focus to find out exactly what is in that water. These latest findings seem the strongest evidence yet that the frogs indeed are trying to tell us something is terribly wrong. Ted? How did they focus on those two particular, what are they, farms? Well, they're in an agricultural area. These were sites where some of the most dramatic examples of deformities were found. Some of the, the multiple limbs and, and very odd-looking frogs were found and found repeatedly. And so they decided to test the water from those particular sites. And it was only last Thursday that they made the decision to send out bottled water to the handful of households in that area. As we both know, Chris, I mean, well water is simply the water that you're pulling up from that particular location, but obviously there are aquifers under the ground that lead into that particular piece of property. So the water is coming from elsewhere. Well, are, one, are they expanding now? Well, one of the startling things is that they took some groundwater and, in fact, were able to induce 
deformities in frogs using some of the groundwater. So that, that suggests very strongly to a lot of scientists that it's very doubtful that it could be parasites or predators, and it points them much closer in the direction of a chemical, or at least some agent, even a natural one, in the water. It, it's interesting to me that one of the Minnesota officials today cited this program and the fact that you had, had completed this phase of your investigation as a reason for holding a press conference today. Uh, I'm wondering how long would they have waited if you were not doing the program today and what is it they're concerned about right now? The sense that, that people are just going to panic at the thought that all water in Minnesota is in some way contaminated? I think the concern is panic and once they realized that word was going to get out that bottled water was going to be shipped out even to a handful of people, uh, there was some concern about that. You know, they stressed again and again today that uh, this is very preliminary. A finding. It has not been peer-reviewed. It hasn't been published in a scientific journal. It's, it's very early in, in the process. At the same time, one of the pollution officials was asked if she would drink the water, and she said no. Chris Bury, many thanks. I'll be back in a moment. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.